Alaska prepares for a presidential visit the world watches and listens. Presidential visits from the past, a trip down memory lane with Dwight Eisenhower, Lyndon Johnson, and Warren Harding. Kotzebue will be on the world stage when President Obama visits here. I'm Emily Carlson. I'll tell you the community's message to him about climate change and how it is threatening their very way of life. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by Kupik Corporation and Spinard Builder Supply. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. Even before statehood, Alaska has been a frontier for presidents, President Obama now included. He arrives in Anchorage on Monday to address a gathering of Arctic leaders from around the world, then is scheduled to make stops in Seward and two other off-the-road system communities. During his two and a half days here, President Obama is expected to use Alaska as a bully pulpit for climate change awareness. He'll visit Kotzebue and Dillingham, where Emily Carlson spoke with Alaskans who have been struggling to adapt to different weather patterns. In Alaska's Arctic, the waters are warming. This spring, Kotzebue saw the hottest May on record, eight degrees warmer than usual. Um, it appears that the water is higher than it normally would be when I was growing up. Soon the whole world will be watching Kotzebue and its challenges. Cyrus Harris notices drastic changes on the north shores of the village, a place he and other subsistence hunters camp during the summer. This is a part of the land that did get eroded. This at one time was sitting there. So a lot of this is getting washed out. Erosion is slowly eating away land at the beach, but that's not all. Cyrus says climate change is also impacting his way of life. Cyrus subsistence hunts for other elders in town who can't anymore. This year, he says receding sea ice made it more difficult to find bearded seal. This spring, we had a, like a three-day time frame practically for a decent ugu hunting. We normally would have two weeks. 500 miles away in Dillingham, a similar problem. That uh, embankment was further out. 76-year-old Anna Sorensen watches as the shore near the home her husband built nearly 40 years ago crumbles away. I would like it to stay the same for generations because there isn't that much left in the world that is so beautiful. Like her Aleut ancestors, Anna relies on subsistence to survive. She's frying up her favorite dish, moose liver. Anna has a message for President Obama. I want, would like it to remain the same. I would like the erosion to, to stop if possible. It's happening all along the coast of Dillingham. At Kanakanak Beach, erosion has eaten away as much as 20 feet in the last 10 years. Trees topple over as the soil crumbles beneath the roots. This homeowner threw junk over the cliffs of their property, a desperate attempt to stop climate change. At the harbor, the federal government paid more than $10 million for this retaining wall to help contain the erosion. In Kotzebue, federal dollars paid for this $36 million barrier that protects homes against the rising waters. What was once receding shoreline is now road and concrete. But still, many people fear this. Two decades ago in Bristol Bay, erosion forced the village of Clarks Point to relocate to higher ground. I think uh, the rest of the world got to realize that climate change is happening and that it is man-made. Elder Willie Goodwin thinks relocation is inevitable. The former Kotzebue mayor says the Inupiat people have been adapting to change for decades. This is Willie's dad in the early 60s, subsistence hunting and dog sledding. Willie wants the president to know the people who live in the Arctic are ready for what lies ahead. I'm going to go back and 
say something here that the uh, advice had been given to me by my elders and when I was a little boy and been going on for thousands of years is that whatever has been put on earth, we shouldn't fight over. Otherwise, something bad happens. But the consequences will largely be dealt with by the next generation. Kids like Willie's great granddaughter. It's kind of kind of get pasiva. And Elizabeth Ferguson. Every aspect from our culture is slowly disappearing, whether it be our, our language or our subsistence activities, um, our values even. A lot of it is definitely slowly um, kind of dying out. Elizabeth is embarrassed she only knows a few words of Inupiat. Kind of get pasiva. Every Thursday night, she studies and practices with friends. Elizabeth is worried about young people like her growing up in rural villages. So she got involved. This year, the 21-year-old was crowned Miss Arctic Circle and Miss Weo. She even hugged the first lady at a tribal youth gathering in Washington, D.C. Elizabeth wants the president to help her with a big problem. Youth just not understanding the magnitude of the problem and just not even preparing themselves for wanting to get involved when the time comes. I'm gonna grab a bowl, Mom, and make the salad right here. Back in Anna Sorensen's Dillingham kitchen, daughter Cheryl also worries about the future. I think land and water are the most important subjects because if we don't take care of those, we won't have fish we won't have the, um, the subsistence. As the land where she grew up erodes closer to her mother's home, Cheryl wonders if her children will be able to cook the same subsistence meal. The stories that we have for the land that we want to tell them about it won't be here possibly. And yes, it is emotional, it's tough. It's the same thought that goes through Cyrus Harris's mind every time he watches son Levi fish off the coast of Kotzebue Sound. He grew up out in the country hunting and fishing, so that's what, th this is what he do best. Cyrus hopes the president talks to Alaskans who have been living off the land for generations. I am a big supporter of including local traditional knowledge into their decision-making process. A way of life he fears may not continue forever. A future Cyrus hopes his son will never have to endure. KTVA's Emily Carlson reporting. Well, the president's visit could open up old winds, old wounds. Alaskans at odds with the president's policies want the state to be more than just a backdrop for a personal agenda. Let's just hope the president surprises us. That's what I want. Also up next, we'll hear from two of the Obama administration's biggest voices on the Arctic. President Obama has walked a tightrope on Arctic policy. On the one hand, environmentalists are angry with his decision to allow Shell to drill in Arctic waters. And then on the other, there are those who see the Arctic as a new frontier for development. Both wonder what to make of his video message released in advance of his trip to Alaska. Alaskans are on the front lines of one of the greatest challenges we face this century, climate change. Climate change, a hot issue that gets a cool reception in Alaska. Hey, here we go. Kermit Cole is a longtime political observer who hopes the Alaska Republican majority will play ball nicely. One reason to acknowledge uh, the, the, the president when he visits, no matter who it is, is that this state is really heavily dependent on federal, federal spending. Cole predicts Obama's visit will ultimately raise more questions than answers. Do you see Congress appropriating large amounts of money to move to move villages. We have an opportunity uh, with, this, with, this, uh, with this trip to tell our own story. One of the main storylines for the governor, Alaska's need to develop its oil and gas and other resources for its own well-being. Putting all those ideas into action and fruition. The Arctic Policy Commission, a special legislative committee, has been working with the White House for three years, preparing for the United States to assume the chairmanship of the International Arctic Council. What Alaskans want to hear from the president is, what about the Alaskans? What about our future? How do we finance ports? How do we finance icebreakers? What kind of cooperation should we have internationally? It's our wake-up call. The alarm bells are ringing. 
Alaska's Republican majority has been at odds with many of the president's policies. They claim he wants to use Alaska as a backdrop to burnish his environmental legacy. Let's just hope the president surprises us. He may get criticized, but I think the picture of Alaska is the picture of what he's trying to do in this nation. When you look at the oil and gas, wind, uh, energy, uh, hydro, geothermal, tidal, all that's part of the big picture. Part of that picture, figuring out how to lessen the impacts of climate change. One of many lessons Alaska could then pass on to the country and perhaps to the world. When you look at this energy picture for this country, Alaska is really the incubator for this. This uh, historical cooperation has now become a major force. The president of Iceland says all Arctic leaders need to be reminded and not just President Obama, that they must address climate change through a local democratic process that begins house by house, village by village. One of the biggest challenges, finding balance. And joining us to talk about how we achieve this, uh, former Lieutenant Governor Fran Almer and Bob Papp, who is a retired admiral, but now uh, the United States' special representative to the Arctic. Fran, let's start with you. Finding that balance, uh, there are so many diverse views on how we achieve that. Well, balance, like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder. And I would say, for those who are critical of the balance between development and climate change issues in Alaska, this administration has supported oil development, it's supported energy efficiency, it's supported renewable energy, as well as trying to reduce CO2 emissions that have warmed our climate. So I'd say that is balance. And you might want one more than the other, but I think as America goes forward, we have to do all of those. What do you think about the criticism that, that he's just here for a dog and pony show to burnish his legacy? I think people who say that are a little out of touch with reality because climate change is a global issue that is impacting people, communities, businesses, as well as the environment. And the sooner we take action, climate action, the better we will all be. We are seeing it in Alaska, where over 30 communities have been identified by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as having serious problems with coastal erosion thawing, permafrost, and the very real possibility of having to move. These are huge social costs, and it's not just happening here. It's happening in Louisiana. It's happening on many of the coastal areas around the world. So I think it is important that the president come here, see for himself what is happening, and help communicate to people who maybe aren't seeing it quite as dramatically as the people of the Arctic are, how real this is and how important it is to take action. Bob, you know, it, it must be a challenge. You know, I know that when you were an admiral, you were an ADAC, uh, or when you first started in the Coast Guard. Uh, but it must be a challenge to kind of communicate the Alaskan story. It is a little bit because uh, people have uh, preconceived notions. Uh, I run into so many people in Washington who say, oh, uh, we, we're so passionate about the Arctic. Uh, we're glad you're involved in this. We love the Arctic. We want to do something about it. And when I ask them, well, when's the last time you visited there? Well, I've never been there. Uh, so we need to bring the Arctic to them, I think. And this is part of what the Glacier Conference is going to enable us to do. It's going to draw the attention of the world. And I think most importantly for us, uh, the citizens of the United States, to some of the challenges that we're facing here in the Arctic. But sometimes isn't there a disconnect? Well, it's absolutely a disconnect. In fact, oftentimes when I'm speaking to people in Washington, I point out to them that in Washington, D.C., we're 3,500 miles from Barrow, Alaska. And there's a lot of Canada in between. So, yes, we, we are uh, literally and uh, culturally disconnected from Alaska. And we, we need to bring that closer together. So when people in the Arctic hear that we're head of uh, the Arctic <laughs> Council, they get all excited. They say, you know, it's about time. But they also express a lot of concern that we're not really committed. Well, I think uh, not only people here, but people around the world. Uh, when I went and traveled to all the Arctic countries and presented our Arctic uh, Council Chairmanship Program, uh, they remarked that it's a very balanced program, that it's very aggressive, uh, and uh, expressed a couple of other issues. But primarily, they said, we're very excited about United States leadership because we know when the United States gets interested in an issue or a problem and brings the full force of their government to bear, 
solutions are found. But they said, we're a little concerned about commitment because there's oftentimes a disconnect between policy and then budget appropriations. And uh, we're, we're lagging behind in those budget appropriations, whether it's for an icebreaker, telecommunications systems, uh, deep water port, et cetera. And we need to bring that a little closer together. We don't do that unless you get the attention of the American people who then talk to their legislators and then action by the administration, response by the Congress. Well, it is true that money translates into commitment. Do you think that there's going to be an opportunity from this visit to get some of these things we need, like the icebreakers and other infrastructure? Well, it's incredibly important to have a plan and to be very clear about what the needs are. And if you show an area like Alaska, which is so huge and so challenging, and with so little infrastructure in many of the places that it's absolutely essential to really build up our capacity to respond in case of search and rescue or oil spill, I think it makes it easier to sell that message. I think it's also, however, really important to have what now exists in America, which is a plan of action. So in 2013, the administration adopted the National Arctic Strategy. In 2014, the president signed off on an implementation plan for that strategy. And in this year, January of 2015, an executive order that put in place a steering committee to make it happen. None of that was there prior to 2013. So now there's very concrete action items that are identified by the federal agencies that have responsibilities here. And as Bob said, now we just need some of that money. <laughs> and I know the that operative word. I know our congressional delegation has tried very hard for many years to get the attention of their colleagues about the importance of things like funding an icebreaker. I think Glacier will help tell that story. Well, we're about out of time, but you know, do you feel that this visit of the president is truly historic and why? Well, uh, just the mere fact that he's going to be the first sitting president to visit the U.S. Arctic. Uh, there have been presidents who have stopped in Alaska either to refuel the plane or perhaps to drive to downtown Anchorage. Uh, but no other president has taken the time to go up and visit the villages. And uh, that's, I think, significant and very important to the things we're trying to do. I guess he is the farthest north president in the Arctic. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us. We are going to continue our conversation on the web, so we'll be able to get more in depth into the issues. Thank you, Fran Ulmer, who is chair of the Arctic Research Commission, and Bob Papp, the United States Special Representative to the Arctic. Well, presidential visits are few and far between here in Alaska. Up next, a look at some of those that stand out, like President Warren Harding, the very first visit to the territory from southeast all the way up to the interior. You saw quite a bit. So being able to have a president see Alaska and spend time in Alaska, I think that was a real big deal at the time. With all the talk of presidential travels, that tune, North to Alaska, has sort of been stuck in my head. Mike Phillips wrote that song, which became a huge hit in 1960 after Johnny Horton recorded it. Seems like a fitting backdrop for our look back at presidential visits. Way up north, north to Alaska. Way up north, north to Alaska. This mountain still looks like it did in 1923 when President Warren Harding made a stop here in Talkeetna on a railroad trip back from Fairbanks. He stopped here at the Fairview Inn, the first president to visit the territory. He probably had a good time here, you would think. Well, if he had a few drinks, he probably did have a good time here. The Fairview Inn was brand new, considered pretty fancy for Alaska. History is rife with speculation that something Harding ate here caused his death, but the facts don't bear that out. He didn't start suffering stomach pains until three days after they left Seward heading toward um, Seattle. So what killed Harding? Probably a heart attack. He had extremely high blood pressure and he had an enlarged heart. But Harding did at least have a real Alaskan adventure in his final days, starting with his cruise from Seattle touring Mendenhall Glacier. He not only drove a railroad car, but also a golden spike into tracks in Nenana, not to mention a huge welcome in Ketchikan. It was kind of a big deal to have a president of the United States come to Alaska at that time. It's always been a big deal when a president visits. North to Alaska. 
Alaska to go north to Russia's own. Even Lyndon Johnson's refueling stop at Elmendorf in 1966 generated excitement. He was on American soil for the first time in 17 days. His 28,000-mile odyssey through Southeast Asia was over. Richard Nixon made history in Alaska when he met with Emperor Hirohito at Elmendorf, the first meeting between a president and a Japanese emperor. The rush was on for Alaska's liquid gold in 1975 when President Gerald Ford inspected the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. When the pipeline is completed, oil tax revenues will greatly benefit all the citizens of Alaska and stimulate your entire economy. There was Ronald Reagan's visit with Pope John Paul in Fairbanks, one in which the community put politics aside and rallied behind the two legends in leadership. It makes my heart feel warm just to know that such wonderful things happened in our beautiful state. And a quirky state, too. Hey, Stubbs! Warren Harding is not the politician tourists in Talkeetna are interested in. That distinction goes to the town's honorary Mayor Stubbs. It's nice to meet you, Mayor Stubbs. Can I shake a hand, shake your paw? Well, even at 18 years old, Mayor Stubbs is still a pretty cool cat. And while we were in Talkeetna, we saw him wander in and out of the Fairview Inn. KTVA will cover President Obama's visit in depth during newscasts at 5, 6, and 10 and on KTVA.com. Well, we had a big response to our show last week, Kenai Fish Wars, and we wanted to share some of the comments with you. Don Johnson from Soldatna wrote, Greedy commercial fishers are currently plundering our oceans the same way the commercial timber industry plundered our old growth forests. A correct comparison would have been to link commercial set netters to those giant timber companies. Dale Kelly is executive director of the Alaska Trollers Association, and she writes, I very much appreciate your focus on the importance of sport and commercial fisheries to all Alaskans, as well as your and Andrew Jensen's attention to providing solid information and thoughtful policy discussion. And Kenai set netter Amber Every wrote, this is a picture of my six-year-old daughter, Gracie, this summer. She worked so hard in the boat, she fell asleep standing up in the boat. That is what I am fighting for, to teach the younger generation a hard day's work. Well, thank you all for your comments. We welcome your feedback. You can contact us through the Frontiers section of KTVA.com. And a quick programming note, we will be moving to a new time slot when football begins on September 13th. Frontiers will air at 4.30 and then re-air again at 10.30 after Nightcast. Well, whatever the time or place, it's always a pleasure to explore the frontiers of Alaska with you. And best wishes to Barack Obama as he goes where no president has gone before. We'll see you next week.